what a blessing it is to be alive in Jesus today. Sometimes you got to look at your past life, your old me. You got to say, bye, Felicia. Hello. Hey, somebody turn to your neighbor. Say, bye, Felicia. If you want to check, say, bye, Felicia. Come on now. Listen, turn to your neighbor and introduce yourself to the right and to the left of you. Amen. Go ahead. Get friendly this morning. If you're online, drop in the chat where you are tuning in from. Amen. Hallelujah. In here, somebody. You may be seated this morning. Yes. Amen. Amen. Can we just give a shout of praise for the Lord? I just, I just feel his spirit in here this morning. His, his presence is here with us. Uh, my name is Preston Butler III. I'm a, a minister here at the Father's House. And uh, whether you're here, amen, amen. Whether you're here in the sanctuary, you're joining um, with us in the video experience, or you're tuned in online, I just want to welcome you on behalf of our lead pastor, Pastor Bianca. I'm so glad that you decided to, amen. We can give us a love to our pastor. Yeah. I'm so blessed that you decided to join us and worship this morning. Listen, um, we have a special treat for y'all today, okay? So I'm going to hurry up and get out of the way so we can get to that. I know some people are like, ooh, what, what is it going to be? You'll find out in just a minute, okay? But first, let me just set the stage for us, okay? We are in week four of Failing Forward, where we have been emphasizing how to find purpose after failing. Uh, now, what we have been doing is, and actually, you know what? Maybe this is the first time you're hearing this phrase, fail forward. What, is, what does that mean? Well, this is actually based on a book by John Maxwell, leadership guru. And he explains that we are not bound by our failures, that we can actually learn from our failures to get better, that we can fail forward. And as we have been looking through the life of Peter, one of Jesus's disciples, one purpose that failure serves, it is allows us the opportunity to learn more about who God is. And we see this in Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 16. And you don't even have to turn there. We'll have it up for you on the screen. It says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked the disciples, who do people say that the son of man is? He was asking them, who do people say that I am? In verse 14, well, the disciples replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. But then Jesus asks them, asks them in verse 15, he says, but who do you say that I am? And here we see that Peter is the only one who responds. In verse 16, Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. Here we see that Peter boldly declares that Jesus is the Messiah, the son of God, the fulfillment of a nearly 600 year prophecy. But what we see is that Jesus points out that his declaration was a revelation from God. I believe that Peter's revelation about who Jesus was, was a byproduct of failing forward. See, up until this point in scripture, we have seen that Peter has failed multiple times over and over and over again. But isn't it interesting that he's actually still following Jesus? Even though he failed over and over again, he was still choosing to follow Jesus. And I believe it is because of his failure it is because of his life experience, messing up, making mistakes, just like me and you, but that he doesn't stay bound by his failures. He fails forward and continues to follow Jesus. And through his failures, he's able to discover the truth about who God is, that he is able through his failures to find God in the process. And I want to let you know today, God is asking the same question to you today. Who do you say I am? Who is God to you? And what I believe is that it is through our failures, just like Peter, that we can find God in the process, regardless of the mistakes that we made. But it is through those things. It is through our failures that we can find God. And that's the title of today's message, that we can find God through failure. Now, I told y'all that we have a special treat, okay? Check this out. We get to hear from four people who are going to share their own personal stories about how they have found God through their failure. Come on, come on, come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These are people who are pillars in this church community. 
Amen. They have poured and, 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 and served here. They have blessed me personally. And here's what I know. They have prepared so diligently and they are going to bless you with what they have to share. It is my prayer that through their testimonies, through their stories, that you will be reminded in the places where you have failed, in the places where you have fallen short or you've been in seasons of loss, that you will be reminded that God can use those moments to reveal the truth about who he is, that you can find God through failure. So here's what I need us to do. Okay, what we're going to do is we, I just want you to lean in. Okay, we're going to help a preacher preach. What does that mean? Um, that means you don't have to stay real quiet and silent until they're done. If they say something good, say amen, somebody, okay? If you need them to say it again for your notes, say, say that again. Okay, all right? So we're going to, can you guys just praise God and help me welcome up our first communicator, Chris Galvez? Come on. Come on. Give God some praise. Thank you, Preston. How you doing, Father's House? Like Preston mentioned, my name is Chris Galvez, and I get the honor of being one of the ministers of the gospel here at the Father's House, along with myself, Brian, and Preston. And it's just been such a pleasure to see all that God has done in this community and in this church in the last five plus years. It's nothing short of amazing. And I just want to take a quick second to honor our pastors, our leadership, for just allowing us to come up here today and share with you what God has been doing in our life. Yeah, give God some praise. And I want to take this moment just to share with you how I fell in God, even through failure. You see, growing up, I was exposed to the gospel at a very young age. I got to see God do a lot of amazing things through a lot of people around me. And I've always just believed that God is just good because I've seen him do it time and time again for those around me. And I related so much to Peter in the passage that he speaks in Mark 14, 29, when he responds to Jesus after Jesus had predicted that he would deny him. And, G and Peter's response was like this. He said, even if everyone else deserts you, I never will. And I, and I felt so much in relation to that because I was like, God, I've seen you do too much goodness for me to ever think or deny that, that you can't be good. And it's often easier to believe that God is good when you see what he's doing all around you. But it's something completely different when you're expecting the Lord to do something and the outcome is a disappointment or a failure. However, Jesus, all-knowing and almighty, knew that this life would come with its set of disappointments. That's why he was like, Peter, slow your roll, son. You're speaking way ahead of time right here. I know that you're going to get put in a situation where you're going to feel like you need to deny me. He even tells us in John 16, that here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows. But we're also encouraged because Romans 8, 28 then tells us that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love him. And I want to declare to you today that disappointment doesn't deny God's goodness because God is good. I'm going to say that for the folks in the back online. Disappointment doesn't deny God's goodness. And I want to share a personal story with you guys here today of something that happened in my own life, something that rocked my foundation to its core. In the spring of 2022, I received a phone call from my family that my young, beautiful niece, Nicole, 19 years old, had suffered from a overdose and had to get rushed to the hospital in Sacramento. So I jumped on a flight the next morning, the first one out, and I said, I'm going to go be with the family. I'm going to go be with Nicole. And the doctors came and they visited with us and they said, we have something to share with you guys. Um, Nicole suffered a lot of loss of oxygen to her brain, and we just don't know if she's going to be able to recover from this. And to be quite honest with you, we just don't know if she's even going to make it. But I remember that next day we gathered as a family and we, and we began to declare boldly that God was going to do the miracle work in Nicole's life. Friends and family that were close to the situation that didn't even have a relationship with Jesus or didn't even know who God was in their life came with a sense of hope that God would do something. So I was like, God, okay, this is your perfect setup. Like, I'm just going to alley-oop it and you're just going to slam dunk. You're going to do the miracle. I know you're going to do it. We, we gathered outside of the hospital in a big circle. They allowed me to lead them in a prayer. We even were singing the songs, I'm going to see a victory. We were declaring it. Come on. My mama said I have the voice of an angel, so don't start. <laughs> and so we left that evening feeling hopeful that God was going to do something and that Nicole's miracle was on the way. But I remember going back to the room that night and just having a conversation with the Lord, and I found him very clearly ask me something. And he said, Chris, but what if the miracle doesn't happen? Can you still love me? Will you still believe that I'm good? And I responded in a very Peter fashion, just like he did in John 21, and where he was like, Jesus, you know I love you. I was like, Jesus, you know I'm going to still believe you're good because I, I know you're setting this up for, for something good. That was my mindset in that moment. Yeah. Well, fast forward a few days, we received the news that 
the doctors had came to us and said, listen, we've exhausted all of our resources. We've done everything we can for Nicole, but she's no longer here with us. And we're going to have to pull the plug on her life. And as you could imagine, I was angry. I was hurt. I was confused. And I even questioned God's goodness. I felt like I failed my friends and my family because I'm like, nah, God's going to do it. So I felt like I failed them. But I remembered that conversation we had when he said, Chris, can God still be good despite the outcome? Does it change who he is? And I just want to encourage you here today that the disappointment we face in this life, whether it was that missed miracle that didn't happen, whether it was that failed business, whether it was that relationship that left your heart in pieces or that, or that diagnosis that you received that seems like hopeless, I want to declare to you today that that doesn't define who God is. And it most certainly doesn't deny that God is still good and he's still moving. Because even when we feel that disappointment or failure, we have to remind ourselves what Romans 8.28 tells us, that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called. And listen, we might not ever find the answers that we're looking for here on earth But I want to encourage you here today that God is still good. Because I want to tell you something here today. Even though we lost my niece and she's no longer here with us physically, it has actually allowed healing to happen in our family in a way that we never would have imagined. Her mother gave her life to the Lord not just a year later because of this situation. And relationships that seemed mended like they were never going to get fixed, God is restoring them. So even in this moment of disappointment that I felt like failure, to my family, to my friends, God was still being good. Don't miss that Jesus is constant to never deny his goodness, even in those situations. And this moment marked my view in God forever, and that despite life's failures or disappointments, God is still good. Give God some praise this morning, church. Help me welcome Michaela as she brings it. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. My name is Michaela Martinez, and we have been going through this series where we've been unpacking the failures of Peter. And so one of them, one of the stories that I want to talk about today is this story where Peter steps out in faith and he participates in a miracle. But then one step later, he's drowning. And But I, what I love about this story is that in this, we get to see that God is faithful even when we're faithless. So can you repeat this after me? God is faithful. God. Yes. Amen. Okay. So this passage is found in Matthew 14, 27 through 31. So the disciples are on this boat and they see someone walking on water towards them and they don't recognize it that it's Jesus. And so they're afraid. And so in verse 27, it says, but Jesus immediately said to them, take courage. It is I do not be afraid. And then out of all the disciples, Peter's the only one who responds. And in verse 28, he says, Lord, if it is you, tell me to come to you on the water. So now Peter is stepping out, out of the boat, and he's walking on water. And he takes his eyes off of Jesus for a moment. And in that moment, he is immediately filled with fear, and he begins to drown. And I want to pause here in this story because I want us to put ourselves in the shoes of Peter. Have you ever taken your eyes off of Jesus? Have you ever been in a season of your life where it feels like you're in the middle of a storm and instead of looking at God, you're overwhelmed by your circumstances and your failures? I'm asking this because I've been there before. In year 2022, kind of like Chris, it was not a great year for me. I've experienced loss after loss after loss from being homeless, losing my job, and I just felt like I lost myself. And I remember walking into this room on a Sunday morning, and I sat at the end of those stairs on the floor on my knees, and I wept for three services because I had felt like such a failure. I had felt like God wasn't even there. Despite, my, despite how many times I have seen him move in my life, in this moment, I didn't see him move. And so, like Peter, I was just so focused on my circumstances, and I wasn't focused on Jesus, so I began to feel like I was drowning. And, you know, I even felt like in that moment that I was going to walk away from this church and walk away from ministry and the life that I built here forever, all because I was feeling so, so much shame for doubting that God could move in my life. And so what happens when we take our eyes off of Jesus like Peter did, it drops us down to places that we don't want to be at. But there's good news. Because even when we're faithless, God is faithful. And what I love about this story that we're reading in Matthew, um, it's, it's, I love that it doesn't end here. Because Peter doesn't just doubt and then he's drowning and then he dies. No, that's not the end of the story. What happens is, is it says in verse 31, it says, Immediately, immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and he caught him. 
God was faithful to rescue Peter in the middle of his failures. And God is faithful to rescue you in the middle of your failures. But we have a choice. Are we going to focus on our failures? Or are we going to focus on God's faithfulness? And I, when I shifted my perspective to think about this, it, it completely changed the narrative for me. Because no longer am I thinking of year 2022 as the hardest moment. And no longer am I thinking about that moment on the stairs as my lowest moment. But now I'm thinking of it as the most pivotal in my life. Because I saw, like Peter, he reached out his hand and he grabbed Jesus, he reached out his hand and he grabbed Peter when he was drowning the same way that he did that for Peter. Jesus did that for me. And Jesus wants to do that for you. Yeah. And I could say this now because two years later, you know, I'm living in my dream apartment. I'm not homeless anymore. Praise the Lord. And yeah. And in, with the car that I used to live out of, I get to drive to my full-time job. And God has restored so many little things in my life that felt so broken in that year. And so I get to stand here and declare God's faithfulness. But I'm, if I'm being honest, sometimes we still doubt. And maybe you're here in the room today. And maybe you're doubting. Maybe you feel like you're drowning. And you know when you feel like you're drowning, you're suffocating. You feel like you're panicking. You're so overwhelmed. Maybe you're, you're watching online or you walked into the room today and you feel like this is it. I want to walk away from everything. I want to encourage you that God is faithful. And if God was faithful to pick up Peter when he was drowning, if God was faithful to pick me up and restore my life when I was on my knees and felt hopeless, he is faithful to do the same for you. And so my hope and my prayer is, is that after today, you would walk away knowing that you have a choice. You can look at your failures or you can set your eyes back on Jesus and look at his faithfulness. And so I want, to, I want us to just repeat this one more time to set our postures and get in the, get in, get in the spirit that God is faithful. Say it one more time. Now believe it. Thank you. Thank you. Now let's wake up, Brian. Yes, God is faithful. Thank you, Michaela. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Brian Olson, and I have the honor of serving as a minister here at TFHOC. Uh, <laughs> in Isaiah chapter 49, verse 13, it says that the mountains break forth in, uh, in, uh, in shouts, for the Lord has comforted his people, and he has had compassion on his afflicted ones. So let me hear somebody say, God is compassionate. God is compassionate. Yes, he is. So I'm going to share you a story about a time in my life when I learned that, when I found God in my failure. Uh, some of you may know, but many may not, that uh, my wife and I, we have a son named Carter, and he will be turning 20 in August. Uh, but I'll tell you, when he was about two years old, we started seeing signs and indications in him that he might be on the autism spectrum. And about a few years later, that was confirmed. Um, shortly after that, he started uh, school. And um, as any parents out there with kids on the spectrum or anything will know, school is hard uh, for, for kids, especially, especially when they're younger. And uh, elementary school is a hard time for Carter and, uh, and, and us. And, so, and I mean, we struggled and we prayed and we struggled uh, to, to, to help him to work on his behaviors, his problem behaviors in the classroom. And I'll tell you right now, diagnosis or not, Special needs are not, when your kid is not doing well, you're not doing well. And it drives you to prayer, and it drives you to a lot of it. A year later, Elizabeth and I, my wife, we started um, leading the young adults group at our church that we were at. And I, we loved this group so much, this age group. Uh, we loved having them in our home. And Carter used to love setting up every Wednesday night, getting the room ready for them. Uh, the young adults, I mean, it's a time in your life where you're dealing with a lot of complicated and new things. You're discovering a lot of new things. And we were overjoyed to be able to partner and share with them and lead them through these. And a lot of that would involve, at the end of every night, we would gather and get prayer requests. And we would ask them, what can we be praying for you for? Um, and one week we had, we had a long list. We had a heavy list. Um, but it was the same week that Carter was really having a hard time. Uh, he was having a hard time at school. He was having a hard time at church. He was having a hard time everywhere. Uh, I think we had gotten a call that week that we had to come pick him up early uh, from school, right? Because I think he'd gotten aggressive and hit somebody, maybe even the teacher. And that was probably our second or third call that school year. And so I, I have my prayer list, and I, and I close my eyes to pray, and all I see is Carter. So I was, I mean, I'm spiritually exhausted. I'm physically exhausted. I'm feeling like a failure as a parent <laughs> and as a church leader. 
Maybe you've been there. Maybe you've been to a place like that where you are just on empty, uh, but there's still people that need something from you. The, your spouse needs something from you. Your child needs something from you. Your job needs something from you. Your church needs something from you. I find Peter in a story where he's in that place. In Matthew chapter 26, we see this is the last days before the crucifixion. And uh, Jesus is overwhelmed with emotion. And he says, Peter, James, and John, please come with me. Come with me. Support me in prayer as I process through this. And so they go. But Peter's going through his own things. He's been part of this group too. He knows what's happening. He knows what is coming up ahead. And he's exhausted. He's emotionally drained. But he's supposed to be praying for someone else. That's, that's how I was. And Jesus comes and he, and he finds him and he, and he finds him asleep. That's just what happens when you're drained. And he says, he, he, he kind of checks him a little bit. He's like, hey, Peter, wake up. You need to stay awake. You need to pray. But at the same time, he says to Peter, I know that the spirit is willing and the flesh is weak. He knows Peter's heart is to pray for him. The spirit is willing. But he knows the situation is draining him. Peter's flesh is weak. I felt that in that same way with my son. And when his needs were so front and center, and I was struggling to find the strength to pray for these young people that we were leading. And so in that moment, I said, look, Lord, I'm going to be real honest. I only got enough energy to pray for one group. And closed my eyes, and I entered prayer, and I will never forget this moment ever. The Lord said, as clear as can be in my mind, I know your heart for Carter. You pray for them. In the midst of my chaos and exhaustion, the peace I felt in that moment was so comforting. I thought I was a failure, and God showed me that he knows and he cares. God is compassionate. When we were at our weakest, I was you know, feeling like I failed. That's when God showed who he really is. He's full of compassion. He's full of care. He understands exactly what we're going through. With all the challenges we had with Carter back then and in my own exhaustion, I found out just how powerful God's compassion is. It's a constant reminder we're never alone in struggles. Never. He knows and he cares. God is compassionate. And I want to invite my friend Sam up. It's Brian. Thank you, Brian. Brian, you're a good dad. Um, Hello, my, uh, my name is Sam, and uh, I'm going to share about how God is Lord. All right, I'm going to need y'all to say, God is Lord. God is Lord. He is, and uh, y'all, I've been walking with the Lord for like 12 years now, a little over 12 years, and I can say that I have never stopped loving the Lord. I've loved his grace. I've loved his kindness. I've loved his goodness. I have loved the Lord, but um, we are talking about failing, not about love. So I'm going to keep it a buck with you in that uh, at times I've treated God a little bit more like a side chick than a main chick. So like, like when it was good for me, I was down. When it wasn't good for me, I was not so down. And y'all, my, my failure has, has never been a lack of love for Jesus. My failure has been a lack of submission to him as the Lord of my life. Like, like I wanted my way in addition to his way. I wanted my cake and to eat it too. And so my failure has not been, my failure has not been my lack of love. My failure has been a lack of submission. It's actually in this lack of submission though that I have learned uh, that God is not just my savior. God is my Lord. Okay, so we find this in the life of Peter. See, Peter like Chris said, he, he's like, yo, I'm never going to desert you, Jesus. I'm never going to run away from you. Um, but then just 30 verses later, two chicks calling him out and one dude calling him out. He has denied Jesus three times. And, and the reason he denied Jesus is because he, he had this expectation in his head. Have we ever been in a place where our expectations for life are not meeting our reality in life? All right. So for Peter, he had this, he had this different expectation. 
Peter had this expectation. It was more like Game of Thrones 300 style where he's going to grab a sword, chop a dude's ear off, and fight. And he, they're going to sing Kumbaya together. That was, that was Peter's expectation. So when he sees Jesus headed to the cross, Peter does not respond with faith. Peter responds in fear. Y'all, I've been, I've been in this place. Uh, I said I was going to keep it a buck with you. Um, so back in 2020, uh, we remember the, the fun times of COVID and what was going on during these times. And um, God used COVID to expose the sin um, that was in my life, that I, I was still on the throne and God was a little bit below me. It really, it really brought to light the real place Jesus had in my life. So when, uh, when I was in this relationship that was kind of toxic anyways, and it went away. And then when I lost my job, um, instead of turning to Jesus, um, I, I turned to the wrong things in the world. So I, I had these daddy issues that I just didn't quite deal with. I didn't go to therapy for them, you know, and then they came out and I started pushing all the guys in my life who were trying to hold me accountable. I'm like, no, I'm not going to be honest with you. I'm not going to be open with you. And I pushed them away. Oh, and so I was lonely. And because I was lonely, I would use relationships to cover up what was going on inside of my, my, this feeling of loneliness as they come out. And then uh, this insecurity I started to feel, it came out, I'm trying to project myself to be something that I never was meant to be. And so when none of that was working, I just started partying and going down a road I shouldn't go down to numb more and more. And maybe you're like, like Peter, maybe you're like me, where you've come to this place where you love Jesus as your savior, where you're going to get eternity with him in heaven but when your expectations don't meet your reality, all of a sudden you start turning to everything else around you instead of Jesus. You run in fear instead of stepping out in faith. And y'all, I, I denied God because I expected something different out of my life. But like Peter, I found out that God's way is better than my way. See, Peter failed, I failed, you failed. But when God is involved, failure is not final. Okay, all right, I'm going to say it one more time for the people way up, up in the back. When God is involved, failure is not final. See, all right, so those Peter and I, it was in our failure that we actually found God. See, um, in, in the midst of all the brokenness and denying Jesus and, and, and deserting Jesus, Jesus met Peter and actually turned him into one of the most significant characters in the Bible. He wrote part of the Bible. He's an apostle that walked with Jesus. Many miracles happened through him, but it was in this failure that he found his purpose. I'm no different. I'm not a main character in a Bible, but God did repurpose me because it was in my failure. When I got in touch with his love, I found hope. When I found hope, I found that he wanted to embrace me. He wanted to change me and he repurposed me so that now my whole life is built on helping other people who have failed, who are broken, find Jesus. See, here's the deal. I, I, have, a, I have a roadmap for how to, how to step out of failure. It's my life. And I don't know exactly how you're supposed to do it, but I can point you to one who does. His name is Jesus. He's enthroned in heaven. And so I say, God is Lord. I tried my way, but his way is better. Come on, come on. Let's give it up for these communicators. Amen. Come on, come on. Man, I, I pray today that you have been encouraged by their stories. That you can see that no matter where you may have failed in life, no matter what you may have been facing, no matter the dark season that you were in, but it is through that time, through that failure, through these life experiences that we can come to know that God is faithful, that God is compassionate, that God is good, that God is Lord, and there is so much more. So how do we do this? How do we discover more of God? How can we begin to practically live this out? How can we find God through our failures? I want to leave you with a very practical tip. We have to look and listen. Every single one of them, you heard in their story, even in the midst of their failure, they had to come to a moment where they had to look up and say, God, I'm in a place where I shouldn't be. I've failed. I've fallen flat on my face. I'm in disappointment. I'm feeling weak and exhausted. But God, I have to turn and look to you to say, Lord, what are you trying to teach me through this moment?
They had to stay open and say, God, speak to me. I don't know why I'm going through this trying time. I don't know why I had to lose a loved one. I don't know why my business or my relationship failed. But God, speak to me and give me revelation like Peter to show me the truth of who you are. Now, this sounds good. Okay, I got to just look and listen. But sometimes the devil, he's going to push you away. He's going to try to distract you. And that's why it's going to be hard to be like, Lord, how can I see you through this? But the Bible says that if we seek him, if we look and we listen for him, we will find him. God will meet you right where you are. So today, as you as you leave out of here, I want you to pose this question, the same question that Jesus asked to Peter. Who is God to you? Who is he to you? And that we can look through our lives, even the things that we feel are bad, even the places where we've messed up and made mistakes and feel like we failed to say, God, you're in that too. And I just have to trust that I can see you in it. I believe that there is, is somebody here or maybe you're online and you feel like, well, Pete, you don't know how I failed. You don't know the mistakes that I've made in my life. You don't know what I've done. And those things are actually too big for me to come to God. Maybe, you know, I got to maybe like go pray and get my life right before I come to God. I want to tell you today that God is ready to receive you right now today. That God is ready to meet you right where you are. Failures and all. Jesus came down to this earth to die on the cross so that we could be forgiven of all of our failures, all of our mistakes, all of our faults. And he did that so he can repair our relationship with our heavenly father. Nothing too big. No failure too big. Even if you've walked away and you said, ah, no, nah, how can I come back to God how I am right now? You can. God loves you and he's waiting with open arms. All you have to do is say yes to Jesus. All you have to do is accept the gift of salvation. What does that mean, accepting salvation? It's very simple. One, you're saying, Jesus, you died, but you didn't stay there. You resurrected on the third day with all power in your hands. Two, you're saying, Jesus, all of my failures, all of my mistakes, which the Bible calls sin, I need you to forgive me. And three, you're inviting the Holy Spirit to come into your life. So I want to invite you today to say yes to Jesus, regardless of what your failures, God is saying, I want to meet you right where you are right now. So if that's you today, you want to say yes to Jesus for the first time, or you simply want to come back home on the count of three, I want you to raise your hand. One, two, three. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. Amen. Yeah. Hey Amen. God bless you. Hey, listen, if you're in the video experience or you're online, we see you. We love you. And can we just praise God a little bit more? Look, some people have, have, have found purpose out of their failures. They are stepping into a relationship with Jesus today. Amen. So if that was you, if you raised your hand today, can you just repeat this prayer after me? And can we all say it with them together so they know that they're not alone? Repeat after me. Jesus. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for forgiving me. Today, I choose you. Cleanse my mind. Cleanse my conscience. Cleanse my heart. Holy Spirit, come into my life to give me the power to do what I cannot do. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on.